But th that's the interesting uh, point about the messiness of sleep. So most people seem to up perform the best when they have like a regular sleep schedule. I perhaps am the same, but I don't know that. And I tend to believe that you can also perform relatively optimally with chaos of sleep, of uh, a, like a, a weird soup of like power naps and all-nighters and all of that, as long as you're like happy, mm -hmm. <laughs> doing what you love. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can um, tell me what you think about this. So I, I tend to, for myself, try to minimize stress in life. So what I found for myself with diet, with sleep, is that if I obsess about it being perfect, then I'll actually stress quite a bit when it's not. Like I'll feel shitty uh, when I don't get enough sleep because I know I should be getting more sleep as opposed to the actual physiological effects of not getting enough sleep. I find if I just accept whatever the hell happens, happens and smile and just you know take it all in like david goggins style like if it sucks it's even better or uh, what is it jocko's like good or whatever he says right what's, <laughs> i think there are uh, several things that you said they're important but i i agree that one can have a dysregulated sleep schedule and still be a happy person and productive I mean, much of my life i've pulled all-nighters and slept weird schedules you know i think many people can probably relate to going to sleep, waking up four hours later, being up for an hour or two on your computer, then going back to sleep and getting amazing sleep the next day functioning. Yeah. I think we've, I think it's important that people have highlighted the importance of sleep and getting enough rest. I do think it's gone too far. And now I'm editorializing a little bit, but I think that we've created this anxiety about sleep that it's get, if we don't sleep enough, we're going to get dementia. If we don't get sleep, then uh, you know, the reproductive axis is going to, you know, completely crash. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. And as well, just based on personal experience and based on the fact that, sure, that it may be that a solid eight hours with no in, uh, interruptions in there or nine or 10 could do great benefit, but you can do really well if you do what you say, which is you wake up, you don't want to start stressing about it, creating this meta stress about sleep. Being happy is actually one of the most powerful things that you can do, not allowing yourself to go down that rabbit hole of stress for the following reason. A lot of our fatigue is not due just to the buildup of adenosine or time of day, the circadian thing we were talking about earlier. An additional factor is that effort is in, related to the release of epinephrine, of adrenaline in our brain and body. At some point, those levels get so high that we, get stressed mentally, we get stressed physically, and we want to give up. There are good data published in Cell showing that that signal, the epinephrine signal, is eventually accumulates and there's a, a quit point. Dopamine, the molecule of pursuit and reward and feeling good, resets our ability to be in effort. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but dopamine is actually what epinephrine is made from. If you look at the biochemical cascade, it starts with tyrosine, which is rich in red, found in red meats and things of that sort. And tyrosine is eventually converted through things like L-dopa into dopamine. Dopamine is made into epinephrine. So, I mean, this sounds kind of new agey, but happiness, joy, and pleasure in what you're doing creates a chemical milieu that provides more of the chemicals that allow for effort. <laughs> and there's nothing new agey about that. It's in every biochemistry textbook. Yeah. It's in every decent neuroscience textbook. They just don't talk about the happiness part. They just talk about the dopamine part. So I think that limiting your stress and at least recognizing, okay, if you're pulling an all-nighter or you're somehow on messed up sleep, that there is going to be a point in that 24-hour cycle where your brain is not trustworthy, where your mental state is not worth placing too much weight on because you are near that temperature minimum and near that temperature minimum which is correlates to that two hour about two hours before you would normally wake up the brain is is hobbling along and anything you feel or think at that time should not be given too much value 
But if you can trick yourself into thinking that's the pleasure point, you afford yourself a huge advantage. There's a study done by a colleague of mine at Stanford that showed that positive anticipation about the next day events actually is a powerful metric for creating quality sleep, even if the sleep is very reduced. Hmm. And and you'll love this one. And I, I, I a lot of people are going to, you know, might be critical of this. So I just want to make sure that, so this was work done out of Harvard Medical. It was um, uh, Bob Stickgold's lab and Emily Hoagland did this study that showed looking at OCHEM performance on OCHEM scores. Okay, so organic chemistry at Harvard is a pretty tough subject, yeah. highly motivated. A number of very good control groups in this study. What she showed was that consistency of total sleep duration was far more important for performance on these exams than total sleep duration itself. Mm. So it's not that just getting more sleep allows you to perform better. Consistently getting about the same amount of sleep is more, is better for performance, at least in on OCHEM, yeah. than just getting more. That's interesting. So that's referring to more that there should be a consistent habit versus yeah. uh, the total amount. To to me, like the entirety of the picture of sleep is uh, it's similar to nutrition in that it feels like it's there's so many variables involved and it's so person specific. So, you know, a lot of studies, I mean, this is the way of science, has to look in aggregate the effects on sleep. It doesn't focus on high performers, in, which are individuals, ultimately. Like, the question isn't, uh, so it's a very important question, is like, what kind of diet fights obesity, re reduces obesity? It's another question, what kind of diet allows David Goggins to be the best version of himself? So these high performers in different avenues. And the same thing with sleep, like people that tell me that I should get eight hours of sleep, it's like, it, it's, I I mean, I, I get it and you, they may be right, but they may be very wrong. And There's no evidence that eight is better than six, that you could very well do better on six than on eight. There are a few other things that um, turn out to be strong parameters for success in this domain. For instance, your entire life, waking or asleep is broken up into these 90 minute ultradian cycles. If you look at ability to attend or do math problems or do anything, you know, drive, performance tends to ramp up slowly within a 90 minute cycle peak and then come down at the end of that 90 minute cycle. And in sleep, we go through these stage one, two, three, four, REM, et cetera. We can talk more about that if you like. Those on 90 minute ultradian cycles as well. Ending your sleep after a 90 minute cycle, at the at the near the end of a 90 minute cycle, say at the end of six hours, in many cases is better for you than sleeping an additional hour, seven hours and waking mm -hmm. up in the middle of an ultradian cycle. And there are a few apps that can measure this based on body movements and things like that, that have you your alarm go off at the end of an ultradian yeah, cycle. Yeah. And if you wake up in the middle of an ultradian cycle, sometimes not always, you can be very groggy for a long period of time. I certainly do better on six hours than I do on seven. I happen to like an eight hour sleep, it feels great, but I haven't slept an entire eight hours without waking up in the middle of the night at some point in, I don't know, forever. I can't, I can't remember, it's probably some point in infancy, but, and I function well during the day. I think that that's a big, that's an important parameter is how do you feel during the day? Almost everybody experiences some sort of dip in energy in the late afternoon or what would correlate to their temperature peak. And that's a good time of day to get either a 90, 90 minute or less nap. Or if you're not a napper or you can't nap, feet elevated has been shown to be good for clear out of some of this. Um, the glymphatic system is this kind of like sewer system of the brain that you can clear stuff out. So legs elevated or one thing that I've um, I'm a big proponent of and that my lab has been studying is what I, I now call NSDR, non-sleep deep rest. And this is just lying down. There are some scripts that we're gonna put out there soon as a, as a free resource. There's some hypnosis scripts that my colleague David Spiegel has put out there as a free resource. But non-sleep deep rest is allowing your system to drop into states of, of real calm that allow you to get better at falling asleep later. And they can be very restorative for cognitive and motor function. There's at least one study um, out of Denmark that shows that the basal, the basal ganglia, which is an area of the brain that's involved in motor planning and action, 
one of these 20 minute non-sleep deep rest protocols resets levels of neuromodulators like dopamine in the basal ganglia to the same levels that they were right after a long night's sleep. So I also respectfully uh, or semi-respectfully disagree with the idea that you can't recover lost sleep. What does that mean? I mean, that there's no IRS for sleep. So what does it mean to be in debt for sleep? If you're falling asleep during the day and you're sleepy, like you're falling asleep, that's a good sign of insomnia. It means you're not sleeping enough at night. If you're fatigued during the day, but you're not falling asleep, so you're just exhausted, but you're not finding yourself falling asleep in meetings and in conversation, then chances are you're fatiguing your system through something else, like a long run in the middle of the night in yeah, Boston or whatever yeah. it is that you're up to lately at uh, 3 a.m. Yes, there is a magic to the nap and I mean, maybe you could speak to the, cause you mentioned these protocols that don't necessarily, so they're non-sleep. But to me, the nap one or two a day can almost irrespective of how much sleep I get the night before, uh, have a fundamental change in my mood and my performance. For the better or for the worse? For the better, for mm -hmm. the better. Yeah, likewise. So uh, I do, tend to kind of experiment with durations. It's it, it's consistently surprising to me how like a nap of like 10 minutes, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you can speak to the perfect duration of a nap, but I find that it's like magic that a short nap does as much good and often better than a longer one for me, for me, subjective. What would be a longer one? Longer uh, than 90 minutes? No, no, like 90 minutes or but longer than 90 minutes, like two hours. Yeah, that's dropping you, starting to drop you into REM sleep. And even if it's a tiny amount of REM sleep, people can come out of those naps kind of disoriented. Right. I mean, remember in sleep, space and time are are totally uncoupled. And so they that's an odd state to re-enter the world in if you're not gonna stay there for a while, like for a good night's sleep. I think a 20 minute nap is pretty fantastic. Would you say that's the op if you were to recommend to the general? It's it's very weird to recommend anything to the general populace because obviously it's very person specific. But what's a good one? Where you say to friends, is twenty minutes a good twenty or thirty up? minutes? Twenty or thirty minutes because you're going unless you're sleep deprived, you're going to stay out of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. If you're sleep deprived, you'll drop right into it. If you've ever traveled and you're really jet lagged, you go to the hotel, you lay down for one second, all of a sudden you're just like. <laughs> you're you're in a psychedelic dream um which can be pretty great too um <laughs> but i think that uh, 20 30 minutes and if you can't sleep some people have trouble napping then learning to relax the body as much as possible like trying to remove all expression from your face completely letting your body kind of float if people have a hard time relaxing when they're awake um there's some terrific uh clinically and research tested hypnosis protocols that we could provide links to that are cost-free and that teach you how to just completely release the alertness button and you just start drifting. Now, the problem is if you don't have a, an alarm or something to go off, You the other day I did one and I, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but there's a component of it where you actually are supposed to let your hand float up because it's a hip, hypnosis script. Mm -hmm. So they, it's my colleague, David Spiegel in the script, he says, um, let your hand float up. I woke up an hour later and my hand was still floating. Oh, wow. Yeah. And awesome. I was and I was completely relaxed. So <laughs> hypnosis awesome. is hypnosis is just a matter of going deep relaxation, narrowing of context. And it's all self-imposed. A lot of people think that hypnosis is like the stage thing with the pendant mm -hmm. and the chicken, you know, people fucking like chickens. Yeah. But you can real hypnosis is self-hypnosis. You're learning to it involves some shifts in the way that you, the, the hypnotic induction involves looking up, closing your eyes, slowly deep breath, and then imagining yourself floating. And people vary on a scale of about one to four, four being the most easily hypnotized. There are a few people who it's very hard for them to allow themselves to, to go into these states, but for most people, they just, they're gone. And it's nice if, if you can have access to those states, because when you come out of it, you feel amazing. You feel like you slept the whole night. At least most people